Be Wealthy and Smart, episode 521. into a world of wealth and financial freedom without budgets, boredom, or bosses on Be Wealthy and Smart. And now, here's your host, Linda P. Jones. Welcome to Be Wealthy and Smart. I'm Linda P. Jones, America's Wealth Mentor, empowering women and men worldwide to financial freedom. On today's show, I have an interview for you that I think you're going to really like. And this woman is extremely knowledgeable, wrote a fantastic book, And we're going to talk about some of the challenges of real estate over the last 25 years, just changes in the market, and what particular issues that millennials are facing today that makes it very difficult for them buying houses. I know that you're going to like this. Here we go. I'm so excited to have on our podcast today, Elise Glink. Elise has written a book, 100 Questions Every First Time Home Buyer Should Ask. Welcome to the show, Elise. Nice Nice to be be here, Linda. Linda. Thanks Thanks for having having me. me. Oh, I'm so excited to have you. You have this phenomenal book that's been so successful. And I understand you're talking about a lot of changes in real estate. Can you tell us about that? You know, I wrote the first edition of this book 25 years ago. It came out in 1994. And what was so interesting about the world in 1994 is for the first time in 1993, uh, mortgage interest rates fell below 7% for the first time and and since basically post-World War II. And that unleashed this incredible buying power. And it got Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, which are the big secondary mortgage lenders, to think about lending in a very different way. And it was the first time they started thinking about lending to people with less than perfect credit. At that time, you still needed 20% to put down in a house. And there was Uh, the big push to lower that and have low down payments, uh, which we have now down to 3%, and in some cases, 0%. And when you have the perspective of looking over 25 years as to all the changes, it just felt like a good time to update the book and explain to the new world of millennials who were just about to take over as the largest portion of first-time homebuyers what they'd be facing. Excellent. And yes, it's been a real roller coaster of interest rates. And it's been nice to see very low interest rates and very helpful to people to have much lower interest rates. What are the issues do you think millennials are having that other people haven't had? So for the first, there's a whole bunch of things that are unique to millennials that um, I think are underappreciated by a lot of people who aren't sort of in the market working with them. So for example, Um, millennials have tons of student debt and you hear about it and you hear that there's 1.4, nearly $1.5 trillion of student debt and millennials have the bulk of that. Although believe it or not, Gen X's and baby boomers still have plenty of their own debt. But when you are coming out of college with 30, 40, 80, 90, $180,000 worth of debt, it's like a mortgage and that debt isn't at 4%. For the most part, that debt is like 8% or 7%. And it's really hard for people who graduated, who didn't get the best jobs coming out, who, who's for whom salaries really haven't changed much in over 20 years. It's been very hard for them to make those payments, save for a down payment for a future house, and also pay all the other kinds of living expenses. And so what you've seen is that millennials have time shifted the major milestones of their early adult lives. Instead of taking four years to get through school, now it's six or seven years to get through college. Once they're done with college, then they move back home. And instead of leaving right away to get an apartment, they don't. They live at home for a bunch of years. The average age of first-time home buyers 25 years ago was about 26. Today, it's nearly 34. If you live in a big city and you're a millennial, you're not even getting married until your early 30s. You're not having a kid until you're 34 or 35. And so a lot of this is very different from 25 years ago, and it requires a different level of thinking and planning. Very interesting. I didn't realize that about the age difference in the purchasers. That's unbelievable. 
it's really important to understand how the rise of home prices, which has been rising dramatically since about 2013, 2014, in almost every market except a few big ones like Chicago or Las Vegas hasn't really recovered yet either. But in most of the country, you've seen a tremendous rise in home prices. Home prices over the last five years have gone up more than 40 percent. And salaries have not. Salaries have barely budged up, you know, beyond the, they basically not even kept up with the rate of inflation over 20, 25 years. And so what you've seen is, is the ability, the affordability factor is really big, but it's really significant for first time buyers. And that's not only because home prices have gone up, but there are so few new properties being built that are affordable to them. So we used to, you know, back 20 years ago, we had builders building first-time buyer communities. They're by and large not really doing that anymore. And so millennials have had to rent ever more expensive homes. And that also cuts into their ability to save for, you know, buying a house. So lots of things are conspiring to change the age at which millennials can afford to buy a house. When I was younger, I started with a condominium and then worked my way into a home after that. But Nowadays, those lower priced condominiums, like you say, they don't necessarily exist. So what can millennials do to help their situation? Well, one of the things they do is that they, they just wait. Um, the other big change you're seeing is that in waiting, they're having fewer children. So the number of, of you know, two, two children per couple is kind of a replacement number. And we've fallen below that in this country. And so we, we have, up until now, depended on an influx of immigrants to come to this country to keep up, you know, all sorts of things, but numbers being, you know, one of them. But millennials who delay till their mid-30s are, tend to have much fewer children or they're tending to have no children. And so what they, the, one of the ways they cope is delaying marriage and children. Um, they're also delaying or putting off having multiple children and might just have one and a dog. Millennials love having animals, um, pets, and then they're buying smaller homes. Um, they're staying more urban and they're really, in some cases in very expensive communities, they're buying vacation homes as a first home and then just staying with a rental in, you know, near where they work. Interesting. I mean, it used to be that you had to go farther out to get a less expensive home. And so then people ended up with these huge commutes. But like you say, now they're wanting to live more urban, walk to work if they can. Is that a long-term trend that you continue to see? I think it is for at least this generation and probably the generation after. Um, you know, my kids who are now 21 and almost this week and 23, uh, you know, are also, you know, the same way, right? They, they are urbanites. They don't need much. They're not materialistic um, in any way, shape, or form. They, like all millennials, and actually my two are Gen Z, beyond millennials, um, they're all about experiences and travel and with less of an emphasis on collecting stuff. They don't want our stuff. They've already told us. <laughs> they don't collect their own stuff. Um, so it's interesting to see how generationally uh, these next few generations are placing a different emphasis. And I think that's just because they somehow they realize that owning their own home and having room for that uh, might be a delayed process. Mm -hmm. And yet we find that with baby boomers, it's been such an important part of wealth creation for baby boomers to own a home. But they've now gotten so expensive, as you said, that it's out of the reach of millennials. So how are millennials going to have that nice forced savings or appreciation from home purchase if they can't afford to get into a home? That's a real issue. Well, there's a couple of issues regarding uh, millennials, Gen Zs, and the way that they keep their jobs. So, you know, in the generation of baby boomers, you still go went to work for a company and you might stay there 20 or 30 years. Some did, some didn't, but you had longer terms of employment. Millennials have been about, you know, they tend to move around a lot. And as you know, uh, every time you go to join a new company, it's often you can't uh, join their 401k plan for a year. So you go to work for a company, you can't join their 401k plan right away. 
And even if you did, you're living at the end of their means, your means, you know, 78% of Americans are living paycheck to paycheck right now. And so you end up in a situation where millennials can't afford to buy homes and build equity that way. And they don't stick around at their jobs long enough. They miss crucial years as they jump from job to job of putting money away for the long run as well. And so I, I really worry about millennials and their long-term financial stability. As for baby boomers, well, baby boomers, it turns out, is a generation that never met a debt they didn't like. And so many baby boomers are going into retirement with 30-year mortgages, nearly brand new mortgages. And they've done, um, they've already tapped because of the recession, they've tapped their 401ks. And so we may have never seen a generation as ill-prepared for retirement as today's current baby boomers. So it makes me worry that in what's arguably the best economy we've had in 10 years, so many people are living on the edge with so little to prop them up. I agree with you. It's a real issue. And Yet, I think the one good thing is that baby boomers tended to buy homes, and so they can downsize, and some of them, I'm seeing, are using that as their retirement nest egg. But if someone doesn't buy a home and have the forced savings, even if there's no appreciation in their home, the forced savings from paying off a mortgage will at least give them that, you know, will at least give them some net worth in the future. Yeah. And I'm concerned about that for millennials who have this trend of not wanting to own a home. I mean, there is a trend toward just renting, right? Correct. There is. And, and it, renting expensively, right? So there used to be this conversation, well, you could rent cheaper than you could buy. And if you rent and then stick away the extra, you know, into investments, you would do about as well as if you bought a more expensive home. But it turns out that's not really true. And the numbers don't really support it. You're much better off, you know, buying a home and then prepaying your mortgage as fast as possible. And one of the problems we're seeing, one of the reasons that home values are skyrocketing is not only are we not building enough replacement homes, you know, because some portion of the housing stock ages out every year, and then you've got a larger number of people looking to buy homes. So you're not building enough replacement or new construction homes. But at the same time, you also have people who um, are just not you'd sell it. And, and the, the reason that they're not selling is that they locked in such low interest rates over the last 10 years that it would be more expensive for them to buy a smaller home elsewhere. And if they had to refinance to pay for whatever next part of that home they had, they're finding that those numbers don't work out either. And so we're seeing people stay in their homes for a very long time. And that is causing real problems and angst and anxiety for millennials who do want to buy those homes. They're just not available. That's right. And we had foreign buyers, too, because uh, where I'm from in Seattle, the market was dominated by buyers from particularly China, that came in and sight unseen would buy homes, not even rent them out. They would just leave them empty. And right. it became a real issue for inventory. So now the prices have come down a little bit. We're starting to see more inventory come back on the market. But I wonder if that is going to be a trend that is going to continue with the foreign buyers. Do you think that is shifting the market? I think, I think foreign, foreign buyers, buyers have shifted the market tremendously. You've got Asian an Asian influx in the West Coast that has now moved inward, uh, internal to the U.S. And so you get Asian buyers who are looking now in Memphis. And they're buying homes to rent out, um, you know, as investors. And truly, there's not enough homes available for investors anymore because in the wake of the Great Recession, hedge funds, private equity funds sopped up tens of thousands of these houses that were in foreclosure or about to go into foreclosure, and they ended up renting a lot of them back to the people who owned them prior. And so that took a lot of the housing stock off the market as well. And there was an expectation that these um, private equity companies would just resell those houses in three or four years. And, and in fact, they're not doing that. They're making so much money renting them out that now they're looking to build homes so that they can rent those out. And again, it takes a lot when you're not, you know, the number of new homes that are being built in this country is a fraction of what it should be. We should be producing over a million new construction homes a year, and we're doing about 600,000. That's a 40% drop, and it's been that way 
except for the years that we were at 300,000 new homes built um, over the last 10 years. And so there's a huge number of homes just missing in the marketplace. And that's problematic for millennials particularly. And what do you think will solve that? Will a market where prices are dropping, will that solve it? Because people will finally maybe get a little spooked and want to cash in their capital gains and their and, and not see their prices fall some more because we've already seen uh, drops of over 12% in some housing on the West Coast last year. And then uh, also the luxury market has really crashed, in, in my estimation, that we've seen prices come down 25% in some cases on very high-end real estate. So is is this softening of prices going to solve some of the inventory issue? No. no. And I, I'm not sure, you know, if I agree with all of your numbers. Um, I think in pockets, you know, you're seeing very high-priced homes come down. But the truth is the number of people who can afford a $100 million house, right, or and even a $13 million house is very, very small compared to the number of people who could afford a quarter of a million or a $300,000 house. And so the houses for the vast majority of Americans, those prices are just going up. And I think they went up about 5% last year. But again, the averages are kind of odd. There's so few homes selling in some markets, so few homes in the market that what you're seeing is um, even medians, which is the same number of homes selling above is below that midpoint and averages, which takes it all together and then divides by that number. Those they're skewed by higher end homes that are selling in the say three to four million dollar range versus very few selling in the hundred to two hundred thousand dollar range. So I think what I'm saying is the only thing that's going to get this market to normalize a little bit is when interest rates go up. But unfortunately, the people who will be hit the hardest at that point, and again, affordability will be an issue, uh, will be millennials. And so it's hard to understand what will fix this in a way that makes it easier for millennials to buy. What I've done in the book, though, in 100 questions every first time homebuyer should ask, is I've provided some strategies for getting around some of these problems and help people understand that, you know, way, types of properties they may want to look at to invest in where you live in one and you rent out the other part of it, or um, co-ownership opportunities. There are shared appreciation mortgages that are playing out again. Um, there are, you can buy in a, in not as good a neighborhood. You can buy a smaller place and add on to it later. So there are some strategies where millennials can come in and just get a house because to your point, it's the beginning of real savings and net worth development, and I'd love to see them do that. Well, that is phenomenal. How can people get more information about this? Sure. Um, the book, 100 Questions Every First Time Home Buyer Should Ask, make sure you get the blue edition. It's the fourth edition, available at Amazon, uh, Barnes & Noble, Borders, wherever books are sold online. Um, you can also find me at my website, thinkglink.com, T-H-I-N-K-G-L-I-N-K.com, and uh, sign up for my free weekly newsletter, which gives you all kinds of current up-to-date information, comes out on Mondays, it's free, there's no ads. All we do is pro try to provide you with a little bit of guidance on what's going on with real estate in the U.S. That is phenomenal. Thank you so much for joining us. I appreciate all the tips you've shared. It's a pleasure, Linda. Thanks for having me. Thank you for listening to Be Wealthy and Smart with Linda P. Jones. Share the wealth and tell your family and friends about the show. Check out our website, blog, and social media for more riches at www.bewealthyandsmart.com.